Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. A few quick announcements before we get started this morning. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find this address on pleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com, along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. Christmas Day is nearly upon us, but are you ready? What's generally implied by this question is, do you have your decorations up? Have you finished your shopping? Are all the Christmas cards on their way? Do we have a workable plan to be able to get everywhere that we must on the big day? Are we ready for Christmas? With Christmas comes all the hustle and bustle of the season. And as a result, we all too often lose sight of the real meaning behind the day. As we rush from one Christmas activity to another, our attitude often bears the brunt of our busyness. So, when I ask, are we ready for Christmas, I'm asking about more than our activities. I'm asking about whether we're prepared heart, mind, and soul to celebrate the birth of Jesus. When the big day of Jesus' birth arrived, most were ill-prepared. And those who were prepared weren't the ones that we would have expected, shepherds and wise men from the East. Those we would have expected to be watching for the signs of Christ's birth weren't ready when the time came. The religious leaders, they knew where the Christ was to be born, but missed the signs of the time. Jesus would later explain during his ministry in Luke chapter 10, Verse 21, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. God revealed himself clearly to the oddballs of society, fishermen and tax collectors, prostitutes and shepherds, while hiding himself from the learned. God has always had a heart for the oppressed. So far in our series about the arrival of Christ, we have talked about how the hope we have in Jesus' second coming impacts our day-to-day -day lives. How Jesus calls us to serve those in the world around us as we live in this fallen world. And how aligning ourselves with God's desire fills us with real joy. This week, we'll talk about how we can follow the example of our great shepherd by lifting the oppressed around us. There's a lot of discussion these days about oppression. But what does it mean to be oppressed? Years ago, Bob Dylan sang, You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And he was right. We are all controlled by someone or something in our lives. The real question is whether the one controlling us is the one that can set us free. The shepherds at the time of Jesus' birth were oppressed under Roman rule. We always assume that they were from the area around Bethlehem, a shepherding community. Like David before him and the generations between them, they were, not, they were out tending their flocks. But what if they weren't from Bethlehem? Other regions were known for their flocks as well. Like Joseph and Mary, they would have had to return to the town of their ancestry. Unlike the carpenter and his betrothed, they would have been forced to bring their flocks along with them. 
Whether they were currently residing around Bethlehem or not, they were oppressed under the rule of the emperor. Their lives were dictated by his whim whether they agreed with him or stood opposed to him. Yet God has always had a heart for the oppressed. Early on, God enacted laws that ensured that the lowly were cared for. Moses records God's command in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. He also says in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 to 19, Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. In these ways and others, God cared for those who were unable to care for themselves. He shepherded the oppressed, meeting them in their need with real solutions. In a sense, the shepherds, when they went to Jesus' side to worship him, had gone to worship one like themselves, the great shepherd of their souls. Micah prophesied about the, about his coming in chapter 5, verses 2 through 5 of his book. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his, his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. The one who was born would be the great shepherd, who would stand in the strength of the Lord. He would bring them security as they shared his greatness to the ends of the earth. Likewise, Asaph sang of the great shepherd in Psalm chapter 80, verses 1 through 7. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. From Asaph's description, it must have felt as though God had deserted his people to the devices of their oppressors. Yet, Asaph recognizes that though God sometimes seems absent, he still has compassion on us and wants the best for us. God's heart is for the oppressed. It's God's heart that Mary sang about when visiting her cousin Elizabeth. The angel Gabriel had visited Mary in Nazareth, explaining that God's favor rested on her. She would be the one who would bear God's son, Jesus. And after hearing God's plan and expressing her willingness to be part of it, she went to visit Elizabeth, who was 
whom she was told was about six months pregnant herself. When she arrived in the hill country of Judea and went into her cousin's house, the baby Elizabeth was carrying within her leapt inside of her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And though no one had told her about Mary's pregnancy, she prophesied about Mary's willingness to be used of God. To which Mary sang in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to... Be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. She begins by singing of God's choice to include her as part of his plan, then quickly transitions to the great things that God has done, not only for her, but for all people everywhere. In choosing her, his lowly servant, he was He has turned the world on its head. In short, out of of his deep compassion, God reached out to the oppressed, first in a spiritual sense and then in a physical sense through the hand of Jesus. God's promise to provide a Savior for those who would choose to follow him was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus brought about a new kind of salvation. For centuries, God's people had relied on the Old Covenant sacrificial system to make them right with God, but they were left wanting more. God felt distant to them, and they wanted a personal Savior, a personal relationship with Him. The writer of Hebrews explained it this way in chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When we think of the oppressed, we think of those who are under the control of someone or something beyond themselves. Yet we're all oppressed. Without Jesus in our lives, we're all under the oppression of our sinful desire. Often, even with Jesus in our lives, we try to overcome sin by our own will and continue to fall short of God's desire for us, allowing oppression to return. We have a great shepherd, though, who guides us in the ways of God, one who has filled us as followers of his with his Holy Spirit, and he is the great shepherd of the oppressed. When he completed what he was born to do, he ascended to the right hand of his heavenly Father to reign forever, and he left us with a great purpose to shepherd those who have yet to come into his fold. And so this week, my challenge for you is this. Take up the shepherd's staff 
and lead someone in your life to the next step in their relationship with their Heavenly Father. Maybe it's introducing them for the first time to the reason for the season. Maybe it's investing time to study God's Word with them. Or maybe it's inviting them to finally decide to follow Jesus as Lord of their life. Jesus is our great shepherd, and we are called to shepherd those in our lives into a relationship with him. This brings us to a time of communion, a time when we share together with Christ as well as with one another as followers of Christ. In preparation for this time of communion, as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made for each and every one of us, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture. A passage from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. I share this this passage with you today because it's a prophecy spoken early in the life of Christ even during his childhood. And it expresses his purpose for being born. I think that's important for us to remember, especially during the season of Christmas, to remember why it was that Jesus was born. We set up our nativity scenes. we, We talk about the birth of Christ, but sometimes we seem to forget why Jesus came. He came to bring salvation. He came to be a light to the nations, to be seen and and to save those in our lives. With that purpose in mind, we remember not just the significance of his birth, but the significance of his death, his sacrifice, his broken body, his shed blood there on the cross. And so in this moment, Let's partake of the bread that represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ there on the cross. And the juice that represents his shed blood that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much We thank you that we are able to be here together, to be able to share in this time of worship. And Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you that through his sacrifice that we are able to live a better life, that we are able to follow the example of Christ as he followed your example. And Father, we thank you that in him, being filled with his spirit, that we can live according to your desire for us and that we might bring glory and honor to you in our day-to-day lives. Father, forgive us of our sins and lead us in the ways of transformation according to your will. Father, we thank you and we pray these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, to be able to share from the scriptures what God has for us together today. 
May God bless us and keep us in His will. I look forward to the next time we're able to be together, either in person at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in southeast Minnesota, beginning with our Sunday school at 9.30 and followed by our worship service at 10.30, or once again here online, first posted during this live feed at 11 a.m. each Sunday morning, and then reposted via our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or our website. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. God bless and stay well.